interesting conversation. And across America. And across America. And there's been a really interesting conversation in New York City on the high end of the real estate market about smaller studios that are more affordable. And there may be some coalition building that could happen around that. Yeah, I think I think that's right, and that's been sort of a lot of our work, and it actually isn't just about the high end. It's really about, again, putting out more choice there. I mean, if somebody wants to choose, right now, you can't build new construction in New York City. You can't build an apartment for less than that's less than 400 square feet. Now, first of all, if you look at other countries, if you look at Western Europe, if you look at Japan, I mean, this is sort of a palatial standard, to be honest. Um, and while I see you making a face, the fact is people purchase a housing bundle. They're buying a neighborhood, a community, they're buying stores that they can relate to, they're buying a transportation trip to work that works for them. They're trading off many, many things for that housing unit. And in fact, the advantages both from an environmental green point of view, which certainly your building you know, focused on as well, um, and from a improving density and an increasing density, which is a good thing. I mean, we're a city, that's what we are. We're not the suburbs, right? We're not a rural area. Um, these are all big advantages for New York and there's really no reason why single adults who choose to either share or live alone can't opt for purchasing a smaller space. But in fact, all of our regulations work against that. And so I, I, I think, mm -hmm. you know, and again, I think your building is a good example of that, of showing how you can meet these other goals of sort of creating a green building and mm -hmm. being in a, a very sort of, you know, dense, well-transportation connected community. All these things work in your building. You know, I think a key piece, if we talk about expanding supply, would be really challenging that law about three unrelated adults because what do college students do when they graduate? They end up sharing because they can't afford to do otherwise. And to bring this out of the darkness and make it legitimate, I think would allow it. Part of the challenges here is how do you make an economically viable option for a landlord who has an apartment building, something that's not abusive and not exploitative, and to the extent that the law supported them in having more than three unrelated people together, it would make it easier. So I've been taught that when you're like looking at a problem like this, you do some stakeholder analysis. And this may be an impolite question to ask in public. I've been meaning to ask it to you on the phone. But you were the HPD commissioner. It would seem to me that you were well positioned to, you know, promote some of this this change that you've got. Mm -hmm. So wh who are the stakeholders that uh, that that prefer the status quo? That you know, help us understand how it works at that level. Well, it was interesting because I was commissioner between 2000 and 2004, although I worked in the agency for 18 years. Um, while I was commissioner, you know, New York is a city where, you know, everybody has a housing gripe, right? I mean, <laughs> like I got called by like Bianca Jagger, you know, with a, <laughs> like who had like a housing problem. I was like, really? Okay, <laughs> fine. You know, I sort of, and I had to send a code inspector because she was ironically living in a rent stabilized apartment. So, I, you know, anyway. Um, but in the, in the four years that I sat in that seat, no one ever came to me to raise the issue of the underground housing market. No one. The issue gurgled up inside our agency really from discussions with our code inspectors who were you know, sort of facing this issue in real life, and then it's the, it's the classic public policy conundrum. The acts that government has basically falls on the people that you're not really trying to hurt, right? The acts is issue a vacate order. Okay, that punishes the owner a little bit, but it really punishes the people living in the place. So there was always this struggle of on the one hand you as as a government official you can't leave people that you knowingly know that you know are living in vulnerable conditions particularly unsafe conditions but by the same token your only tool is essentially to make them homeless so you know we began to look at this issue and we actually while i was there we actually had a little uh, informal working group of you know, all the agencies involved, from buildings and city planning to the fire department. And ultimately, what undid our discussions at that time, and I can't speak to what has happened since then, was 
really around um, the zoning issues and the, the city planning issues. Ironically, in my experience, the fire department was sort of willing to talk and willing to think through, well, what are really the most egregious things that we totally can't live with and you know what, what could be tweaked to be made safe somewhat. Um, but the, ultimately, the, the rules around density, occupancy, what makes a one or two family house, for example, in that case, you know, legal under zoning, those things just derailed the discussion. Um, what we were able to do since that time, working with particularly Matt Wambua, who, was just, who just left as housing commissioner, he was very open to thinking about a pilot for the micro units, which is actually hopefully underway. I mean, it's like facing a lot of hostility, frankly, in the public approval process. Um, but the issues around the shared housing mm -hmm. and um, the houses that are already illegal, like an illegal basement, cellar, all of that, became very difficult and is actually was under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice coordinator. So who, when you think about the next administration, you got to ask yourself, whose job is it going to be to help sort through this problem? If it's all on the enforcement side, it's as, as you've said, Tanya, that's, that's not, you know, you need enforcement, but if it's just enforcement alone, you're not going to really solve this problem in a way that's going to be successful for the people that need this kind of housing. So what you need is that combination of choices and enforcement. And you're going to need somebody um, in city government, which sadly, I admit my failure at this. Um, I was not able to be, you know, to boss around other agencies. But you, if you could have somebody at a city hall level that would think this through with you, I think you have agencies that would be willing to, to sort something out. So here's a half-baked thought, and it really is half-baked. The underground housing market that's getting a great deal of regulatory attention right now is the one that Airbnb has, mm -hmm. where people rent their couch or rent their little kid's room when the kid mm -hmm. goes to college. And they are on them like a hen on a June bug. I mean, they are all over them. And the reason is there's revenue, right? If you are not paying the, to the taxes that a hotel would pay, they don't want it to happen, even though it does allow people to come to New York City and be tourists, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just, this is the half-baked idea. I wonder who might have an economic incentive to make it possible to do this better. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good point about Airbnb, and I would also say that while government is kind of attacking them, I think, you know, I don't know why it's like <laughs> we have a million problems, I don't know why Taxes. we have to pick on them, but necessarily, but, you know, they were also turned to, after Hurricane Sandy, as a way to provide short-term relocation for people. So in fact, this idea in a dense city of utilizing those empty rooms that are kind of sprinkled all around the city, I think you're right. I mean, I, you know, I, w I just did a panel, you know, similar to this discussion, only it was about low-income seniors, mm -hmm. right? And it was kind of like, well, why can't we let the seniors in public housing who have three-bedroom apartments right. rent their bedrooms out? I don't know. Does civilization end? Do we destroy community? I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm thinking it's not <laughs> maybe mm -hmm. such a bad idea. And, and I actually said, you know, what about just like an Airbnb for seniors, yeah, right? right? Who are living in in more space than they need in some instances. Um, so I think these are things, again, I, I think if we think about less the word enforcement and more the word choice, which I think, you know, Robert has raised, is, is the way to think about this issue. How to put more choice out there for this population. And I think nothing is, I think everything should be put on the table. Mm -hmm. I have a question about, I mean, who, in terms of the work that that you've been doing, Geraldine, around um, needing regulatory change mm -hmm. to meet the demographics and to meet the ne housing needs of, of single adults, and maybe this is sort of repetitive of Anne's question, but what are the forces against that change? One is, as I said, zoning, right? So it, it dictates density and it dictates 
how much space inside a building can actually be used for residential occupancy. Um, and so in every zone across the city, you know, those numbers are calculated and they all err on the side of pushing away housing for single adults and diminishing that, that number pretty much, um, even in the high density areas, which is sort of surprising. Um, the second are, you know, and, and again, Robert raised this issue, the, the issue of no more than three unrelated adults being permitted to live uh, together. Now, the interesting thing about that regulation is there's about five regulations that deal with that, and they're all a little different, by the way. So one says no more than four, one says no more than three. I mean, you know, it's not as though this accretion of rules over the last 70 years has not gone seamlessly, right? It's all a little conflicting and confusing between the housing maintenance code, the multiple dwelling law, the zoning resolution, the building code weighs in on occupancy standards. None of these occupancy standards, by the way, are based on anything analytical. None of them. So, and there are challenges to this that are coming particularly from some of the new immigrant communities. Um, and there's, you know, there's, there's some academics now doing research on certain populations like Mexican Americans and recent immigrants from Central America who come with a very different vision of privacy, sending your child to sleep alone is like a punishment. In, in the American, you know, Ozzie and Harriet construct of housing, every child should have their own bedroom, right? So some people are challenging this and saying, we have fair housing laws that deny people the right to live that way if they want to get Section 8. How's that fair? So these issues are gurgling up from all different ways. So occupancy rules pretty much have no basis in something analytical, and they're quite conflicting, and they need to be looked at. What people's relationships are, in my view, should not ever be a part of the conversation. In California, their occupancy standards about people's relationships, how many unrelated individuals can live together, was thrown out in a single court case in the 1980s against their own state constitution, which conflicted with the right to privacy. That opened up a whole kind of plethora of strange and interesting ideas. Um, if, you, if any of you saw our exhibition at the Museum of the City of New York, which sadly closed, we showed the work of Ted Smith, who's an architect in California, who's building, started to build after this law change, one family homes in San Diego with ensuite entrances from all the outside. So people got a bedroom and a bath. They got their own entrance from the outside, and they shared a living kitchen dining space in the middle. From the outside, it pretty much looked like everybody else's one family house. If we looked close, you saw a lot of doors. He couldn't build these things fast enough. So I think the, some of these regulatory barriers should be changed. Um, and it should be easier for both people to live together in whatever form their relationships are. Because as Joanne says, today in America, 49% of Americans are single. Um, this is very different than what it was 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and in New York, the number is close to that as well. So, you know, being single is not like you're no longer really having to be defined as being sort of like a sad person with like you know, <laughs> a bottle of wine next to your bed table, you know, go, you know, singing yourself to sleep at night or something. I mean, you know, single people are in the world. They're very, <laughs> They're very engaged. They're very engaged. If you look at the work of Eric Kleinenberg, um, a sociologist from NYU, he's just written a book called Going Solo, and it's very interesting. Um, things have changed. And we have to sort of break down that demonization barrier, which is, is felt probably nowhere more keenly, as, as you've spoken about, as with this population. But we, we should change all these things. And we should make a path to legalization for both the illegal basement seller apartments, as you know, it's the same issue. It's the Pakistani family who's renting space in their cellar to, in order to either accommodate a family, extended family, or to pay their mortgage. Yeah. Why, so, are we, why are we criminalizing them? So it sounds like there's some real potential for coalition building. I think so. 
Thank you. So I don't want to cut off the exchange among the panelists, but I want to include you in it. I work my veterans friend coming up Veterans Day. We make that in one day, two hundred fifteen dollars. Who defines what is what is what is HRA stake in all this? Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. You know, I got kicked out of a three quarter house because I refused to take public assistance. I can work. I'm healthy. You know, it doesn't make any sense. Two fifteen. What? And the problem is with three quarter houses. Honestly, the blind leading the blind. Some of the housing managers there, they have their own problems they need to deal with before they to get them in the house. I think you raise an important point, and one of the issues that we've seen is that for people living in three-quarter houses, when they do apply for supportive housing, um, they are a low-priority population because they're not considered homeless. And so that question of what is the definition of homelessness is really key. A low priority population, from what we've seen, um, really means no chance of getting into the housing. And so people um, wind up stuck and without options because they're not currently in the shelter or on the street. So was the three-quarter house one that mandated treatment at a specific place? And could the issue have been that you weren't Medicaid and therefore I, I didn't a source of revenue? Right. Right. Thank you. Um, his mic wasn't working. This, so. Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Norma Fernandez. I'm from um, the DA's office, and I work with the reentry component, Com Alert. So. He asked about what, what, how do you define homelessness? I, I, I want to just focus on what encompasses that. And I think it's number one, the HRA system that you get on public assistance because that's how you pay your um, rent. And then they mandate them to participate in a WEP program that really it's no longevity there. There's no, what, it's not a means to an end. You're working, so I think that's another, that's one of the stressors. There's no, go at the end of that. They have people in buildings doing union jobs and they're collecting public assistance. I think that they should be allowed to start going into training so that at some point acquire some marketable skills and then that they can move out on their own and, and be able to pay for low income housing or whatever or even have money to move in with someone or something. But when you have someone that's on public assistance they're mandated to do a web program. Then they're living in a three-quarter house that they're just going to a treatment program. I don't think where you live at should define the level of treatment if required treatment. So if you have someone that doesn't have a substance abuse diagnosis, like I go through this all the time because Kamala provides, we have, our, we have a substance abuse treatment provider on site and a lot of the men are not allowed to come into Kamala because they have to go to these uh, Freedom House, Narco Freedom. Um, everyone's contracted out with a program, and I think that just makes someone digress. When, when you're making them, when you don't give them the opportunity, and I think if you define the word re-entry, I think it's about options and having opportunities, and I don't think that the systems that are involved allow that, and, and that's the, the issue, I think, that encompasses uh, homelessness. Can, right. can I respond a little bit to the gentleman's question? Because I think, you know, in, in a general way, you know, government, all three layers of government um, are going to define homelessness, and it's about how funding sources get, you know, pushed in to different programmatic government responses. But if you look at, for example, the work coming out of the mayor's office for the, the Center of Economic Opportunity, um, which has redefined a measure of poverty and really shown that most people living in poverty in New York go to work every day. So. You know, I think what the, the issue you're raising of sort of the, the people caught in between because you're working and the disincentives that the system creates for people who are working, in a way, that's the population that gets the least amount of help, ironically, 
Um, and that should be something that's thought about. The two programs for housing subsidies that were designed specifically for that were public housing and Section 8 rental subsidies. <laughs> those were the programs designed for people who were going to work. Both those programs are completely dying of a thousand cuts. So while, you know, I don't want to make everybody feel overwhelmed by the millions of things that, you know, you need to do after this, but, <laughs> you know, I had a wonderful professor when I went to City College who used to say, you know, whether or not you're interested in politics, politics is interested in you. Uh -huh. So, you know, you could be on the sidelines of these discussions, but then stuff is going to happen. And, and what's happening to you is that you're living at a time when the programs that were actually designed to help you are no longer being funded. And that's a, you know, that's another thing to think about when you want to advocate for three-quarter houses. Thank you. I just wanted to make uh, two observations and then uh, talk about the coalition and how, we, how to build that. Uh, my name is Larry Wood. I work as a community organizer at Goddard Riverside. And for eight years, I did work with the SRO Law Project. Uh, we also run um, Manhattan Outreach Consortium. So we do outreach to uh, homeless adults in the streets of New York, uh, Manhattan. And we also run 600 uh, units of supported housing. So we've thought a lot about these uh, this issues. And we know that the thing that's so frustrating is we know there's cost-effective solutions out there. There's a way to, to resolve this crisis. The issue is how do we generate the political will? And I really appreciate you putting in a larger context because we haven't come full circle. We've come three-quarter circle, <laughs> in a sense, in terms of the policies around uh, housing singles in the city. And uh, they, they can be corrected. The, um, the number of legal SRO units in the city, it's hard to also get a, an exact number, but it's probably about 30 to 40,000 units is our estimate. So the illegal units, at least two or three times more. And, and that's, you know, there's certainly a lot of more units out there that, that probably haven't been captured by these uh, different estimates. And, and Tasha, I, I so appreciated you kicking us off. Uh, you were so thoughtful. And, um, but these issues about illegal lockouts, overcrowding, bogus programs, They've been going on for decades, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, and we really have to you know, get, get on top of them. Now, in terms of generating the political will, we had an interesting meeting at Goddard Riverside last week. Uh, a number of housing and homeless advocacy coalitions formed this year in the, way, in the light of the uh, mayoral election. One was United Day and Homelessness, uh, homeless advocates put together. a &HD had Our Cities, Our Homes. There's the Housing First campaign and then there's a real rent reform campaign. Leaders from each of these coalitions met last week to hammer out a one-page paper at invitation of the de Blasio campaign, uh, we're already thinking transition, but there's an opening to meet with housing advocates to talk about trying to push his agenda. Um, candidate de Blasio has come out with a pretty ambitious housing plan, um, and it's gonna get a lot of pushback, and it's, he's gonna have to work with the housing and homeless and tenant advocacy community to, to make any headway. One of the things that's very encouraging is he's apparently responding to Achaya and the base campaign. In his position papers, he does want to explore legalizing basement apartments and um, doing it in a safe way. So there's an opening with the potential new administration. And the housing groups recognize that and have, you know, looking at including this in our list of demands uh, to address and to follow up on. So I'm, I'm just encouraged. I've been dealing with these issues like many of you for a long time. It's been extremely frustrating. But I see an opening with the new administration. It's going to get a tremendous amount of pushback. Homeowners associations who don't want immigrants moving into their community, uh, people who are afraid of homeless programs or programs that serve as offenders, they, it's just tremendous pushback to overcome. So we really we have an opportunity, though, know, and that's what I want to end on. There's an opportunity, and I invite people to get involved with those coalitions if you know they exist. Support that work, because to generate the political will is going to take a lot of work collectively. Thank you. Thank you. So next was um, two people in the front row. Melissa, if you could bring the mic up. No, I know, but I didn't see hands from the others. Wave it. <laughs> Hi, my name is James Greer. Um, I'm a student at MCNY. I'm from uh, MSW. 
Um, I heard a question, and I got some information off the website, and it, in Texas they have this, um, is what is this called? If you need to get certificates for a house, three quarter houses and stuff, so they did that already. It's been successful. It's called Tron, T-R-O-H-N. They have a website. You could go to www.tron.organization. And it's called Texas Recovery Oriented Housing Network. So it's been successful there. If you're really looking for the answer, you could probably, and he has, is a question, is, is quest, you can ask questions to him. He has a, um, he has an email, ebutton at addictiondirections.com. So uh, I thought I'd mention that. The other thing, I wanted to touch on some issues that I heard. Um, it's ironic that I'm here today because I'm doing community service as um, for my um, college intern, right? And so one of the things we do is put theory and practice together, you know. So, um, so I heard some issues like legality issues, 30-day violations, right? And um, my question is, <clears throat> I, you know, these houses, like you said, they have people there who um, are trying to get their lives together. Then you have some people who are not there for that, some people who are mandated and angry that they're there. So how do we control these people? Because I, I don't think that the housing people say, hey, let's just throw somebody out. It's got to be a reason. You know, so my, I would ask, why are they throwing them out? Because I am I came from there. You know, I was incarcerated numerous times, right? But the last time I made a conscious decision to get my life together, and like somebody mentioned, I couldn't go back to housing because if you, if you commit a crime on 